Mbaka mwaka wa samanini na mbini Sutulikuwa ni watu Kitu kumoja Mwaka wa samanini na moja Sabina tisa Wakati wa hayati mzee chomo kinyata Japo kuwa atu, atu kujia kwa kandikisha Ubika marufuku Tulikuwa kitu kumoja Before January 1993, Moses Masika Wetangula had never met President Daniel Arap Moi. By this time, 10 years after Wetangula represented the 1982 coup plotters, the man's stature had grown in leaps and bounds. Wetangula and company advocates had since moved from Luthuli Avenue in the midst of what Wetangula calls 24-hour disco noise and crossed Moi Avenue, first settling at Hughes Building on Kenyatta Avenue, then to Queensway House on Mamangina Street, before taking tenancy at Corner House, a most prestigious address at the time, located at the junction of Mamangina Street and Kimathi Street. The skyscraper had practices run by the likes of Mutula Kilonzo, who was the president's lawyer, and Wetangula's university classmate, Fatuma Sichale, among a dozen other top law firms. Wetangula's client portfolio had similarly fattened to include blue-chip companies and state corporations. At that juncture, according to Wetangula, running for office was the last thing on his mind. But something else had happened. Part 2. The President's On the Line and Other Short Stories In December 1991, Moi had capitulated and agreed to repeal Section 2A of the Constitution, allowing for multipartism. It was the outcome of the subsequent 29th December 1992 general election, which Wetangula hadn't participated in, that changed the course of Wetangula's life. I think uh, it is then that courage that uh, put me on the national map, and when Multipartism was restored in 1992 after the repeal of Section 2A and uh, going to the elections uh, and uh, a very vibrant team of young politicians were elected to parliament. Paul Mwite, Martha Karua, James Orengo, Nyang Nyongo, Mukhisa Kitui, uh, Kiraitu Murungi, and Mother Karua. All those uh, very, very uh, vibrant, fearless, articulate uh, young parliamentarians had come into the House after the second multi-party election in 1992-93. Then one Evening, I was in my office, and uh, my secretary comes to call me and says, There's somebody on the line. I used to work from, uh, in Stendhal, since I started my work life, I've always go to my office by six, and I never leave until after seven. That's my work ethic. I had a very vibrant secretary called uh, Jessica Olinga. Jessica, uh, with the, while we were working in the office at about seven, now elections were over and uh, everybody's watching what's going on. She comes to me and says, uh, there's somebody on the phone called Moi. I said, go and tell him uh, that uh, I'm meeting a client, I'll call him. She said, I'll not talk to him. I think it is the president. I'm not going to take that call again. You come and talk to him. So I walked uh, and picked the phone. Uh, and uh, true, it was Mzemoi. I had physically never met Mzemoi. I never shaken his hand. Uh, he says, uh, how are you, Moses? I said, I'm fine, uh, Your Excellency. And he says, congratulations. I said, uh, what have I done, uh, Your Excellency? He said, you have been nominated to parliament. Uh, you're going to Parliament, and I want you to be part of my team that will help my party and my government in uh, what is going to look like a very, very vibrant uh, multi-party Parliament. You can see the people who have been elected, 
and I've picked you because of your courage. I have been reading about you, I've been seeing you on uh, TV, then there was uh, KTN was the only TV station in Kenya, I've been seeing you on TV, and I believe you will give uh, your best to me as uh, your president and to my government. And when you go to parliament, I want you to be part of the speaker's panel so that you also help in uh, keeping parliament under control and uh, you must uh, uh, do your very best within uh, the context of uh, our situation. And I said, thank you, Your Excellency. And uh, there my now second journey in politics started. Being a member of the speaker's panel was akin to being a temporary deputy speaker, meaning Moy was looking to commandeer the multi-party parliament in whichever little ways he could. The following morning, Watangula was invited to State House Nairobi alongside JJ Kamotho and Gigi Karioki, both of whom had lost elections and had been nominated. The other Kanu nominees were Wilson Dolo Aya and Zipporah Kitoni. Also present were Elijah Mwangale, who had just lost to Dr. Muhisa Kitui, Attorney General Amos Wako, Vice President Professor George Saitoti, Nicholas Biwot, and State House Comptroller Franklin Bett, Wetangula's contemporary. From that point onwards, Wetangula became part and parcel of the Kanu and Moi machinery. But be that as it may, Wetangula, in his own admission, faced a daunting existential crisis. Bungoma, the place where he came from, was solidly an opposition stronghold, with members of the Bukusu community having fallen in line to the last man in support of Ford Kenya, even after the death of their patriarch, Pius Henry Masinde Muliro. Michael Kijana Wamalwa had been elected Ford Kenya's second vice chairman in 1992 and became Muliro's undisputed heir. went through the 7th parliament, navigating uh, very carefully between uh, the interests of my great friend Wamala Kijana, with whom we came from the same stock, and serving Mzemoi, with whom they were on opposites. I served the whole of the 7th parliament as uh, a member of the speaker's panel, uh, deputizing uh, Ole Kaparo and my former university teacher, Dr. Godana, who was the debut speaker. And uh, it went pretty well. And uh, by the end of the term, I had made up my mind that that was the place to be. And that's the place I have been to date. This balancing act of trying to please Moi and not harm Wamalwa is what turned Wetangula's nomination into a curse and a blessing. A blessing because it launched his political career a curse, since to his critics, working for Moi at a time when the entirety of Bungoma was against the man had elements of betrayal, a sort of blemish which Wetangula contends with to date. Wetangula was to pay a price for his 1992 choices during the 1997 general election. Still keen on remaining useful to Moi, Wetangula threw in his lot with Kanu when he sought the Sirisia constituency parliamentary seat at the time held by his teacher at French School Kamusinga, Ford Kenya's John Munyasia. At the end of uh, the seventh parliament, uh, Mzemoy encouraged me to run. And uh, by the middle of the term, I started making very active uh, political activities in uh, then uh, Sirisia constituency, where the MP was uh, John Munyasia. John Munyasia was my high school teacher in Kamsinga, and to date he remains one of my greatest friends. Uh, he had a lot of impact on us when he was teaching us in Kamsinga. He was my MP at the time, I was nominated. We worked reasonably well, of course, with small bits and pieces of rivalry. And then in uh, 1997, I decided to go and run. Munyasia's superpower was that he was as gifted an orator as the rest of the Ford Kenya hotbloods, so that there was a joke that if one had beef with Munyasia, then the biggest mistake they could make was to allow Munyasia to open his mouth, because the moment he started speaking, you'd forget you were feuding with him. 
Among the Bukusu, Masinde Muliro had built a tradition of asking the electorate not to merely elect representatives, but to instead elect warriors who would form part of his battalion at the national stage. To pass this message, Muliro would summon the triumphalist spirits of Bukusu warriors of Yore, especially those who won the infamous Naitiri War, a cluster of fighters who were simply referred to as Naitirian. And so, as he moved from one constituency to the next, Muliro would tell voters he only wanted them to elect leaders of the Naitirian caliber. Nenya Naitirian, he would say. I only want Naitirian. And this would be the code for the electorate to vote for whichever candidate Muliro endorsed. Michael Kijana Wamalwa inherited Muliro's rulebook. And so, as Wetangula campaigned in Sirisia on a Kanu ticket, Kijana Wamalwa swept the rest of Bungoma and Transnzoia, asking the electorate to only give him the warriors of the Nigerian kind, all of whom had to be Ford Kenya candidates. The electorate listened and acted accordingly. I enjoyed a very good relationship with him. He went around campaigning against everybody who stood against his MPs, except in my constituency, he didn't come there. Uh, I didn't win, but I got a respectable uh, 8,000 votes for a first uh, shot. Then when the elections ended, I went to see Mzemoy, and he gave me very valuable adv advice. He told me, young man, all politics are local. Uh, if you had uh, sought my advice, I would have encouraged you to go to join Wamalwa, run on, on Ford Kenya, win, and if you won, then I would have a good friend in the opposition. And I'm sure when chips are down, you'll stand with me and by me. It's a piece of advice where Tangula has never forgotten and never hesitates to dish out. Those who will secure 20 or 30 members another 10 or 5 will be in the opposition on the opposition bench to criticize the government. Now it is up to the government to, 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 to see how the country runs. And with that, Moy appointed Wetangula as the inaugural chairman of the Energy Regulatory Commission, ERC, which has since become the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority, IPRA, where he served for two and a half years before resigning to focus on serious politics. This time, Watangula implemented Moy's advice religiously. Uh, I was there for about uh, two and a half years. And then uh, I left to start preparing for the two or two, two or three elections. That time I was actively in uh, the fold of Wamalwa. We were going around the country together, working together. I was uh, his lawyer, uh, running briefs for him and briefs for the party. And uh, come 22 or three uh, elections, I, I walked through with a lot of ease. Uh, we carried out nominations. I defeated my teacher, Munyasia. Uh, went to elections. Uh, it was uh, an easy run and it has been so up to date for me, thanks to the people of uh, Sirisia then, and the Bungoma in general who have a lot of trust and uh, support for me. Uh, we came in uh, with the, the NAC wave, which swept the country. Zekibaki as our president at the time. And uh, when I got into that uh, ninth parliament, uh, I was not nominated into the first cabinet. But about a year later, um, Zekibaki called me and uh, told me he wanted to appoint me as an assistant minister for foreign affairs. Perhaps I should step back a little and tell you that uh, when we were carrying out the elections of two of three, I know for sure, because I worked very closely with Omalwa, 
that the people who are eventually appointed from Wamalwa's stock as ministers were not the people Wamalwa proposed. Wamalwa had proposed his first choice was myself, his second choice was the late Kulundu and others. Uh, but it turned out um, Zekibaki appointed uh, others other than us. But uh, shortly thereafter, I think uh, before uh, Omalua uh, passed on, I think he kept on putting pressure on Kibaki that uh, he felt he should change because as his confidant, his legal advisor, and his uh, a very close friend, he felt guilty that I was left out because uh, Everybody had seen during the two or three campaigns that uh, I was everywhere with Omalwa and uh, it took people a surprise, by surprise when uh, I was nominated to cabinet. Michael Kijana Wamalwa died two months later at a time when Wetangula's metamorphosis from Kanu's cockerel to Ford Kenya's lion seemed complete. When Masinde Muliro died in August 1992, the order of succession within Ford Kenya and by extension his Bukusu constituency was uncomplicated. Mohisa Kitui, who was a leading light in the party, considered on grounds that he was young. Musikari Kombo, who was one of Muliro's right-hand men and a key financier, gave way to his senior. Michael Kijana Wamalwa stepped into the role with the full blessings of those who had coalesced around Muliro and Ford Kenya. However, Wamalwa's succession wasn't as seamless. Mohisa Kitui, Musikari Kombo and Noah Wekesa each wanted to lead the party. Wetangula, who was still making inroads within the Ford Kenya fraternity, supported Kombo with the promise that Kombo would hand over to him when the time was ripe. Kombo won the seat. And yet, Musikari Kombo wasn't Michael Kijana Wamalwa. Where Wamalwa deployed charisma, Kombo employed the slow motion counsel of the wise. And where Wamalwa was burning with ambition, Kombo was handling Muliro's legacy with velvet gloves, making it almost impossible for the party to roar. Soon, little uprisings fermented. Ford Kenya's currency had always been what Mohisa Kitui calls electricity. Charged rhetoric delivered with a battery of hotheads coupled with an anti-establishment groundswell, unavoidable even if they were in government, like Wamalwa's candid I am afraid power has gotten into our head speech delivered just before his demise. Combo neither exhibited nor inspired any of this. Seeing the electricity gap in Ford Kenya, Wetangula started plotting a takeover. In the meantime, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Wetangula deputized Kalonzo Musyoka, a man he had first met in 1985. At the time, a by-election had been occasioned in Kitui North constituency, and 32-year-old Musyoka was throwing his hat in the ring. As a show of solidarity, a group of young lawyers got together to fundraise for Musyoka. Wetangula was among them, giving a worthy contribution of 500 bob. Then quickly came Chirau Ali Makwere as Minister of Foreign Affairs, before he was replaced by Wetangula's favorite, Rafael Tuju. Unfortunately for Tuju, he lost the 2007 elections. Uh, during the elections, of course, you know the, the rift between uh, ODM and, uh, and uh, then uh, PNU, uh, very cutting edge results. Uh, we won, there was a big dispute. There was a very ugly incident in the country, conflicts, losses of life, destruction of property.
And it's at that time that uh, immediately after elections, uh, Tuju had not won. I was his assistant, I had won. And the uh, institutional memory in the ministry was vested in me. And the President Kibaki did not have any difficulty in naming me as foreign minister and uh, embarked on... Uh, in fact, before I was named foreign minister, uh, he started sending me around to try and bring in uh, a team to help the country stop what was now a full-scale conflict arising out of uh, elections. People were being killed in the Rift Valley, infrastructure was being destroyed. You remember the uprooting of the railway in Kibera. There was an attempt to blow up a bridge in Tarbo and uh, people uh, running away from their farms, their homes. Uh, I went to Addis, to the AU, to address the AU and inform them of the situation in the country. Uh, while I was in Addis, I was called from my office, uh, informed that President Kibaki had uh, named me as his foreign minister. So it gave me a great authority to talk to the continent. And uh, one of the things that I'll never forget is uh, I addressed the plenary of the AU, assured them of the calming of the situation in the country and uh, that uh, Kenya was back to healing itself because at that time uh, Raila had sent a young Nyongo and somebody else to Addis to come and agitate for uh, Kenya being sanctioned by the African Union. Uh, using my influence then, uh, they were not allowed to address the, the AU plenary. But to my embarrassment after addressing the Union, plenary. I step out and I see Kenya on fire. All the TVs, the BBC, Al Jazeera, Sky, they were beaming on Kenya. And there was a terrible bonfire in Naivasha. You remember the Naivasha incident where families were burned in houses and, and so on. It became very difficult to uh, convince uh, the continent, uh, that uh, all was well. It is then that I convinced uh, the chairman of the union uh, then, uh, Jean Ping from Gabon, to come to Kenya and talk to both parties. He came immediately. I flew back and when I arrived I told the President Kibaki, or rather advised him, that this is a matter that we need uh, some mediation from external uh, actors. So we said, let's not escalate this to non-Africans. Um, Mzee Kibaki, Mudaura, myself, one or two other people. Then I agreed that I go to West Africa to look for the chairman of the AU, John Kufu, who is still uh, living and a good friend. We communicate, we talk to each other uh, every other week. He's even finishing up his memoirs where he has a full chapter on me. We, I flew to Accra. I found he was away in his village in Kumasi. Uh, he sent his uh, presidential plan to pick me, uh, take me from Accra to Kumasi. Accra to Kumasi is about a one and a half hours flight. In about one hour's flight, I went, met him at his private home briefed him, uh, made a call to President Kibaki, uh, they talked to him, and uh, then uh, him and I addressed the international media at his residence, and uh, he agreed to fly into Kenya the following day. He took two days, I uh, came back. In that meeting, uh, I consulted Mze Kibaki, and President Kufu and I agreed then that we bring in Kofi Annan, uh, I gave an opinion that we needed a regional leader who knew this East African region well. So we settled on President uh, Benjamin Mukapa, who had just uh, retired as a president of Tanzania and uh, carried a lot of respect in the region. 
And then uh, we said, uh, being Africa, we also need to bring in uh, a lady who understands the intricacies of conflicts uh, with that and how they affect families. So we scouted around which uh, lady to bring in. We had a few names, uh, Tibaijuka from Tanzania, uh, uh, Gertrude Mogela from Tanzania. But eventually we settled on Mama Grasa Marshall uh, from Mozambique, but then married to Mze Mandela. Uh, so Mze Kibaki instructed me to look for them. This was the precursor to the Serena talks. From there onwards, Wetangula took his rightful place in the Kibaki government. I ask Wetangula, now that he's worked with Moi and Kibaki, what were they like? You know, they were totally different personalities. Muse Moi enjoyed uh, talking to everybody. Uh, you you could even say enjoyed listening to gossip uh, because you could sit in a lunch table on a lunch table at State House and people who liked gossiping and maligning others will be having a field day, you know. Mzeo najua uyu, najua uyu, nini. And he listened to them. Sometimes he acted on those uh, issues, sometimes he didn't. But he was a very, very uh, extrovert character. Uh, who talked to everybody. You went around the country, Mzemoy literally knew an individual by name in every village in this country. Probably because of his longevity in politics, you know. He first went to parliament in 1956 and he was there until 202. So that is a long, long time. Uh, Mzemoy also uh, liked going everywhere. He was not a person who sat and let things happen. He was hands-on sometimes the, uh, to the level of intrusion in the discretions of his appointees. You could see uh, people being uh, summarily dismissed uh, at four o'clock news and so on. Uh, even when you travel with Mzemoy, like uh, once he invited me to an official trip to Brussels. We traveled and uh, when you are there, you obligated to have a joint breakfast with him, joint lunch with him, joint dinner with him uh, as a delegation and uh, uh, talking about many things about Kenya. Maui. Kibaki was the complete opposite. Muse Kibaki is a person who spent his time to himself. As his assistant minister of foreign affairs for five years and foreign minister for an equal number of years, I do not remember any time I even shared a meal with Mzee Kibaki, other than banquets where everybody else is or post-cabinet lunches, because every time we had cabinet, it was followed by a lunch. And uh, he rotated, uh, any minister who has issues can sit on his table, I talk to him, and the next time another one, another one, another one. But he minded his business. He was never involved in any discussions about anybody. He was to himself. He would be reading, or he calls you, you come and give him a brief on something, he listens, you will go through. When you are done, he says, thank you, I'm satisfied. If he's not, he says, can you go and look at this area, this area, this area. And uh, when people were agitated about something, Mze Kibaki would just uh, very calmly and, uh, and, and with uh, a lot of wisdom remind you that, young man, life is not about people you like. Life is about people you live with. So all these people that you are worried about, uh, we must live with them. Uh, so find a way of engaging other than complaining. And that was Mzee Kibaki. Na kuna mwenyewe hapa au ni mama au ni baba, 
angalia anajivuna kutembea mbele ya watu na hana aibu mtu kama huyo ni bure kabisa anahitaji kutwagwa makofi when you went out of the country um, Zeki Baki took his room he would come to meetings after the meetings he goes back to his room to do his reading or his resting or whatever he, he, they were totally different people and i enjoyed working with both because each one of them gave me a different degree of exposure a different degree of of uh, experience and using both i think i can now say i'm uh, the better person uh, than what i was before i met them